Hello, my name is Nikolai Yusupov. I'm a certified critical care paramedic in New York City. And today I'd like to talk to you about logistics of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or non-invasive ventilation. This is essentially, as you know it, as CPAP or BiPAP ventilation. And we'll discuss the management for the critical care transport provider. And if you go to my website, criticalcareift.org, I'll have the notes as well as links to all the manuals mentioned here. And you could post questions and comments regarding this presentation. What I really like to do with this presentation is cover non-invasive ventilation in depth, including all the modes. And I want to intersperse video clips into this presentation to enhance uh, the visual uh, field for you, so you better understand uh, non-invasive applications. We will discuss non-invasive ventilation with LTV-1200 ventilator operations, but the principles that are in this presentation are very sound with use of any other ventilators that you may encounter in the hospital setting or any other facility for that matter. So what is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation? And essentially by convention, if a ventilator or a standalone machine is interfacing with the patient through tight fitting face mask rather than the endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube, then it's by convention called non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or non-invasive ventilation period. It is a form of mechanical ventilation that provides respiratory assistance without using an invasive or an artificial airway device. And an invasive or an artificial airway device here being endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube. So broadly, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or non-invasive ventilation is essentially an umbrella term that it encompasses all the modes that are available for non-invasive ventilation. And we have three modes here, which is CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure. We have bi-level or aka BiPAP, bi-level uh, positive airway pressure and PSV, pressure support ventilation. So all those modes uh, collectively are known as non-invasive ventilation or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And that's the proper clinical terminology. So whenever you're discussing non-invasive ventilation, uh, this is the terminology you should employ. And here I have a video presentation showing you the difference between invasive versus non-invasive adjuncts. And to show you how the difference, so if a patient is getting uh, gas and oxygen through one of these, this will be non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or non-invasive ventilation. If the patient is ventilating through one of these or one of these, then it's no longer non-invasive because these things are invasive and they go into uh, the trachea and patients being ventilated invasively. Okay, so if a patient is interfacing with a ventilator or a standalone machine with a mask pictured on the left-hand side of the picture, this will entail non-invasive ventilation. And if the patient is interfacing with the ventilator utilizing a tracheostomy tube or and the tracheal tube pictured on the right-hand side of the picture, this will entail invasive ventilation. LTV-1200 by CareFusion states in their warning that the mask employed with LTV-1200 should be a non-vented mask, meaning there should be no holes present in the mask. And if you were to use a vented mask, it will deplete the oxygen supply faster and also may lead to patient ventilator dyssynchrony. This is just a fancy term for patient ventilator bucking. And excessive leakage can also occur if the mask is not properly sealed to the patient's face. You could troubleshoot this by adjusting the Velcro straps on the mask itself, talking to the patient, and making sure it's comfortable and there's no air leaks present around the mask. In addition, I want to um, stress something very important here. If you ever arrived at the floor with a brand new tank with 2000 PSI, and as soon as you transition the patient to your ventilator and your oxygen supply, the ventilator tank automatically just dissipated in the air and you had 2000 PSI to start with. And in five minutes, you look at your gauge, there's almost nothing in the tank. So the reason why this happens is because uh, if you employ a vented mask with holes in them, the ventilator senses that as an air leakage and it starts to overcompensate and starts to utilize excessive oxygen supply. So this is why your oxygen tank that was 2000 PSI is fully drained in a matter of minutes. The important thing to realize here is to utilize hospitals and let oxygen supply up to the point when you're ready to move the patient down to your ambulance. So use the hospital's oxygen uh, tank. And when you're ready to move the patient to your ambulance, quickly switch the oxygen hose to your tank. And this way you have sufficient time to move the patient to your ambulance and not have the tank fully drained. So here I wanna 
show different devices used for delivery of non-invasive ventilation. Mainly, you will utilize a face mask, pictured on the left-hand side of the picture. However, you will frequently see patients with a nasal mask, pictured on the right-hand side of the picture. The difference here is that the nasal mask has nasal prongs that extend into the nasal passages, and they facilitate much higher air leakage compared to a face mask, uh, which can give you a much better face seal. So what you want to do here is utilize a chin strap to reduce air leakage from the mouth because the chin strap will keep the mouth closed and you will encourage the patient to breathe through the nasal passages. This will reduce not only the leakage, but your O2 consumption as well. Here we have a total face mask and you will see this being utilized in intensive care units. We also have a fully encapsulating uh, device called a helmet and it's also suitable for delivery of non-invasive ventilation. Who is best suited for non-invasive ventilation? And essentially the best suited candidate is a fully alert, cooperative patient with congestive heart failure, with acute pulmonary edema, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients such as emphysema or chronic bronchitis who present with acute respiratory failure. And certainly these patients need to have an open patent airway on their own accord with intact gag reflex and the ability to swallow whose clinical course is expected to improve in the next one to two hours post non-invasive ventilation application. And you want this patient to be alert because you're going to explain the procedure to them. You want them obviously to cooperate in the procedure so you could apply the mask and you could adjust the straps to eliminate all, all the air leaks. So this um, modality and this treatment is certainly not suited for auto mental status patients with questionable airway reflexes or unable to clear airway secretions who have high risk of aspiration or are uncooperative patients with hemodynamic instability. And if any of these counterindications are present, uh, these patients need to be intubated and transported on invasive ventilation. This is the discussion you may want to have with the sending physician prior to departure. Upon your physical assessment of the patient, if you see the patient is ultimental status and certainly cannot protect his airway for the duration of the transport, you need to find the sending physician and inform him of your findings and the physician may elect to intubate the patient and transport uh, the patient on invasive ventilation. And the way this algorithm plays out in the emergency department is you have a patient with either COPD or CHF come uh, and present in the emergency department with acute respiratory failure. And as soon as the clinicians at that facility determine the patient is in fact the candidate for non-invasive ventilation uh, by being alert and fully cooperative, they place the patient on non-invasive ventilation for one to two hours and they observe the trends. And if we see positive trends, the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is kept for the next four to six hours. And if we achieve the goals, such as improved uh, respiratory function, improved ventilation, improved oxygenation, improved pulse oximetry, improved patient comfort, uh, skin color, uh, improved uh, ABG, uh, that's blood gases, the therapy may continue or the patient may be weaned from uh, non-invasive ventilation. On the other hand, if after one to two hours there's no improvement, a uh, patient certainly is going to get intubated and placed on invasive ventilation unless of course the patient has advanced directive such as DNR or a most form where they specifically indicate DNR or DNI, do not resuscitate or do not intubate. In that case, the patient may get comfort care and may continue non-invasive positive pressure ventilation as one of the comfort care modalities. And is there any evidence to support non-invasive positive pressure ventilation? Well, certainly there was a lot of studies done and they put this concise review, which is a conglomerate of studies. And the conclusions they arrived to is there's abundant level one evidence, meaning there's really good supporting data to support the use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in such critical care settings as acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, particularly related to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients. And hypercapnic respiratory failure, this is known as type 2 respiratory failure in critical care medicine, and your population will be emphysema patients and chronic bronchitis patients. Your other populace is your acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema brought on secondary to uh, congestive heart failure, and these patients have what is known as type 1 respiratory failure or uh, oxygenation uh, failure. It's important to note that 
the study selection here were randomized, controlled clinical trials and cohort studies, and observational studies uh, with authors that considered important or novel. So there's sufficient data to support uh, non-invasive utility in COPD and acute pulmonary edema. Here, what I want to point out is, is the LTV-1200 has an internal PEEP built in into the ventilator. That's the circuit that we employ is conducive to LTV-1200 operations. The reason why this is important, the lesser models of the CareFusion LTV, such as 1100 series, have an external PEEP valve that's attached to the circuit, and the PEEP is adjusted externally. And here we have LTV-1200 circuit, and I want to go over a really important aspect of the circuit. So at the top of the picture, we have the inspiratory limb, and at the bottom of the picture, we have the expiratory limb. Because they're separate limbs, they prevent patients from rebreathing carbon dioxide. And the inspiratory limb, as the name implies, carries oxygen and inhalation gas towards the patient, and expiratory limb carries the carbon dioxide and exhaled gas away from the patient. If you look at the Y that is pointing towards the patient, and this part is connected to the port on the mask, it's important to install the Y so sense lines connections are oriented up while operating. And the reason being why they should remain up towards the ceiling and not towards the floor is because during normal respiratory cycle, the patient makes condensation and moisture. And if the sense lines are pointing down towards the floor, the condensation and moisture may infiltrate and seep in through the lines. And this may give you erroneous readouts and may even inter interfere with your limits. So point the sense lines up towards the ceiling. Here we also have high pressure and low pressure limits that originate at the Y. And the reason why they're termed limits and not alarms is because an alarm is something you silence and don't pay attention to. Limit, there's an action that is performed by a ventilator once it's triggered. So a high pressure limit is only triggered by a ventilator when it senses the circuit pressure has elevated to a predetermined level that you set. So as soon as the ventilator senses high pressure limit, it stops the inhalation of gas and cycles the ventilator to begin exhalation. So if you constantly see the ventilator being triggered high pressure limit, it means the patient is no longer getting ventilation or oxygenation for that matter. So high pressure limit is something that needs to be corrected immediately. A low pressure limit is some type of disconnect. For the most part, you either pull the Y away from the mask or inadvertently pulled on the inspiratory limb out of the 22 millimeter connection and the ventilator senses some type of uh, air leakage and the disconnect is present. At the middle, on the bottom of the picture, we have the exhalation valve. And the important thing to keep in mind is you want to keep that valve exposed and not wrapped in any sheets or blankets. The reason being it facilitates adequate gas exchange uh, away from the patient. And if you cover uh, exhalation valve with sheets and blankets, you may cause intrinsic PEEP to build up or auto PEEP to build up. And auto PEEP has deleterious effects on patient hemodynamics and it's not something you want to encounter during transport. Here is just another uh, picture of the LTV circuit and all the parts are distinct from uh, each other. So you see uh, what they all do. At the top of the Y, we have the sense lines. And as we said, you want to have them up towards the ceiling and not towards the floor. They connect to the ventilator via lure fittings and they're also color coded. The exhalation valve uh, is also connects to the ventilator and it provides very important data for you to track and record, such as exhaled minute ventilation, exhaled tidal volume. And as we said, the exhalation valve is something you want to keep exposed and not covered in sheets. Here's an actual close-up picture of the circuit and the exhalation valve in the red rectangle. And this is the piece you want to have exposed. Uh, also, the manufacturer makes a bacterial and viral filter, which have 99.9 efficiency for bacteria and viruses and what they do is they keep patients bacteria viruses and things like tuberculosis from entering the ventilator and contaminating the unit and here i have uh, three video clips demonstrating the most vital aspects of circuit connections so here we'll have a basic circuit connection this part here connects to the filter Make sure your connection is tight, you don't want nothing pulling out during transport. And these are your sense lines and exhalation lines. So what I like to do before I connect them, I make sure they're actually in, all the way in, because sometimes from the factory, they may be loose. And they're all color-coded. So 
uh, white goes into white, yellow goes into yellow, and this snaps into the last one. So if you just screw screwing them in like this, clockwise, there they may actually come out very easily. Right? There's nothing holding them back. So what I like to do is I take it and I twerk it the other way. And what this allows me to do is when I put it in, it automatically screws in and it will not pop out. So I'll do the same thing for this one. And you can see it automatically just gets into this place. Uh, that's connection. So now, so now the circuit is connected. Here I have a video of oxygen host connection from the ventilator to your tank. They'll connect this first to the oxygen and I'm connecting it to the uh, LTV first and if you do that you're gonna see the air is gonna start escaping real quickly from this end. So you don't wanna you don't wanna weed out your oxygen and deplete all your sources. So first thing you do is you have a connection on, on this side. This is your connection. So, first thing, connect your LTV. Make sure it's tight. You don't want air escaping from this side either. So once it's tight, then you will connect your oxygen supply. And here is a video demonstration of what I meant when I said point the sense lines up towards the ceiling and not towards the floor. And these are your sense lines. And when they're connected to the patients, you want to make sure the sense lines are pointed upright. They're not down. So the condensation that the patient makes doesn't get transferred here and goes to your sense lines and then all your uh, data is, is, is not accurate. So make sure they're pointing up. As was stated in the beginning of the presentation, the correct terminology to employ is NPPV or NAV, and that's an umbrella term that encompasses all three modes available for non-invasive ventilation, which are CPAP, BiPAP, and PSV. That is the proper clinical terminology and should be used in the clinical setting. At times, you'll hear clinicians such as respiratory therapists, physicians, and even nurses refer to all the modes collectively as BiPAP, and that's actually incorrect. BiPAP is a trademark name, and the term may only be found on standalone BiPAP vision machines made by Philips Respironics. Here is a picture of such machine. If you look at the right top hand corner of the picture, you see BiPAP clearly shown on the machine itself. And that's a trademark name that was branded by Philips Respironics on such machines.